Welcome back to this week's GCN Tech Clinic, where as always, we answer the questions you've been submitting using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And again, it's two for the price of one today. Got the both of us. Yeah, you can get your questions down below in the comment section and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible. Without further ado, uh, this week's first question comes from Pierre de Blesser, who says, Hi, I've got a road bike from 2020. It's a giant Propel Advance 2 disc. Um, and it's, he's done more than 15 and a half thousand kilometers on it. Good going. Yeah, nice. Um, and he's asking if this is too much for one year's <laughs> worth of riding. Um, what's the lifespan of a carbon frame? Is he going to wear it out? No, you're not going to weigh carbon fiber frame out. Carbon frames don't have a set lifespan on them. So providing that you look after it, it's not damaged and you've not crashed it, dropped it, or just damaged it in any way, then you're going to get many, many good years of service from it. Yeah, yeah. don't worry. I keep worry. riding your bike. Next question. Keep it clean. Yeah, next question is from what I would presume is meant to say big boots. Yeah, yeah. Or 13 ig 13 oots. Yes. Um, does cycling cause memory loss? Because they say we've already addressed the motorbike question very recently. What's he on about? I don't have a clue what he's talking about. Remember. Nah, we do cycling on this channel. Um, anyway, on to our next question, which is um, from uh, Braden Chong. Chong. Yeah, yeah, it says, uh, I'm upgrading my Shimano Sora to 105, group set of people. Um, do I need to change the cables or fit the ones I'm, I'm already using? Will they work? I mean, I, I would say whenever you change something on your bike and you're changing in the cables yeah. or I'm doing them, just fit new ones. Yeah, they're That's like a couple of pounds, aren't they? Yeah. It's just a simple thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and often what you find is when you actually pull a cable through, if, if you're on the side of the road and you're in a, in a pickle, then you might have to do it. But what you find is when you pull a cable through and it's been cut and at the end is slightly frayed, it's very difficult to thread that through the, the outer yeah. and they often get stuck. So yes, always when you're changing components, change your cables as well. Nice, next question is from M for Lamb. It says, how often do you normally need to change cartridge bearings? Also, is there any benefit to trying to grease them periodically? So cartridge bearings, there is no set service life on those. They don't need to be changed when you've done a certain distance or a certain time has passed. It's purely when they start to sound rough or develop a little bit of free play in them. Mm. So if that's your wheel bearings, for example, it'll be when you spin them around, they sound horrible, and there's a little bit of free play when you wobble the wheel left to right. Yeah, uh, they often feel quite rough and gravelly yeah. when, they're, when they're gone, and then it's just time for replacement. But the beauty of cartridge bearings is, is they're very easy to replace even by a home mechanic, yeah, uh, which is very nice. But in terms of, do you need to grease them periodically? No, they're a sealed unit, they've got a really good seal in them, designed to keep water and grit out, but crucially, also keep the grease inside. So leave them be, replace them when they're worn out. Next question is from Tony Lin, who says, hello, I have a quick question about wheels. Would deeper wheels have a harder time on climbs than a shallower wheel if they were both the same weight? No, I don't think they would. No. Like for lightweight. And even mm. if they were a different weight, the, the actual difference it's going to make in real terms on a climb is minuscule. Yeah. If you model a 10 kilometer climb and then compare the difference in terms of you know watts you'll have to produce to go say, I don't know, 30 minutes up a 10 kilometer yeah. climb, you're, you're looking for a sort of 200, 300 gram change in weight, which is the difference between deep and shallow wheels, about a watt. Yeah. It's maybe like but if these things one are the, and a half if, watts, it's, it's very little. If these are the same weight, it's going to make no difference really. Although if you climb particularly fast, you would get the benefit of the aerodynamic wheel. Yeah, hmm. so you would be actually slightly quicker on the more aero wheel. Hmm. By, nice. by much. Next question is from MusicMan119. He says, all else being equal, so we've got everything the same on his bike, what's faster? A 50 millimeter deep front wheel and riding in the drops compared to a 30 millimetre, millimetre deep front wheel, but riding on aero bars. Uh, riding on aero bars. Yeah, your body position yeah. has a far bigger impact. Riding like this yeah. compared to riding like this. Yeah, so your body position has a bigger impact than changing the, some of the components on your bike, basically. Yeah. Optimise the body position first, then optimise your component position. Yeah. Components, sorry. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. Um, next um, question we've got. Vasiliki says, what are the signs that we need to adjust a cup and cone bearing? 
So cup and cone bearings commonly found on Shimano and Campagnolo wheels. Oh, their latest wheels, yeah. Yeah, pretty much all other wheels use sealed cartridge bearings, um, with a few, few exceptions. So then, to adjust them, like I said about the cartridge bearings, it would be the same principle. If your wheel's got a little bit of side-to-side -side play in it, a little bit rattly maybe, then it's just a sign that you could just do a tighten that cartridge bearing up very slightly. Yeah, mm. um, but do be aware of Whereas the bearings are sealed inside a sealed cartridge bearing, yeah. if you undo a cup and cone bearing, your bearings can sort of fall out all over the place. So just make yeah. sure you do it in a place where you can collect everything clearly and see it, and you're not going to lose things under the sofa. That is a good point. Yeah. Next question is from David Flamingo, who asks... That's a cool name. That is a cool <laughs> name. Who asks, um, he'd like to buy a new bike helmet, but there are lots of options and he's a bit confused what to look for. What do we think about the safety of cycling helmets? So he's saying about materials, the shape, rotational safety, what features should he look out for? Says maybe would you choose a helmet which has got on those crash sensors in it, for example. Mm. No, um, specialized make one, don't they? Mm. Um, what would we do? So in terms of rotational safety, I would definitely look for a helmet that has that system in there. So MIPS is the most common one. Um, which, Slip plane. Yeah, devices, that's, that's it. Known. Yeah, that's the, that's the official name, I guess. Yeah, they're you, designed you, to mitigate rotational forces that you, say, when your head hits the road and then slides along it, the helmet rotates so that your neck doesn't. Basically. Yeah. Um, that's definitely a big one for me. If I was looking to purchase a new cycling helmet, I'd, I'd be looking at that as one of yes. the key bits. And, yeah. and while people will, you know, can accuse well, us of, of, of market, trying to market things yeah. and, and all the rest of it, Independent tests have shown that slip plane devices are beneficial in, in crashes. Highly respected independent tests. So don't take hard word for it. Take uh, take that. Materials and shape, though, all helmets tend to be made out of that um, expanded polystyrene. Yeah, expanded right? polystyrene. They all meet the same sort of safety standards and regulations. And in terms of the shape, maybe look towards a slightly aerodynamically shaped helmet. Depends if that's if you're focused on speed or ventilation. So mm. so take your pick from those, really. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Last question this week we've got is from Radin Farazan. Nailed it. Yeah, hopefully. Um, Hi GCN Tech says they've bought a second hand direct mount rim brake frame and it came with one brake adapter which he was told was for the rear brake. Question, what does it do and does he need one for the front? Ah, I know what this is. Really? So this is common on a number of different frames, particularly the one that stands out to me is the rim brake Canyon Air Road. So behind the rear brake, you have that little plate. And the reason that is there is because when you apply the brake and the force on direct mount rim brake calipers, it kind of almost pushes the caliper apart slightly. So that little bit of plate is to add some support to the frame. Otherwise, as you apply the brake, you're sort of applying a bit of flex onto the seat stays. Right. And you don't need one for the front, because where it mounts is on a real thick, sturdy part of the fork, where mm. there's a lot of strength in there already. Yeah, a lot of reinforcement. So yeah, make sure you fit that onto your bike when you fit your brake caliper. Otherwise, you run the risk of putting additional stress, stress through the seat stays. Hmm. Right, I didn't know that. That's yeah, to know. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Glad, you, glad you're here. Yeah. Whew. Right, well, sorry if we haven't had time to answer your question this week, as that's all we've got time for. But be persistent, keep firing them down, in the comments section below using the hashtag AskGCNTech and hopefully we'll get round to answering your question in a future episode as it's always a pleasure being able to answer your questions. Um, and just don't ask the motorbike question again. We've answered that. Have twice. we? Are you sure? I can't remember. Oh no, I don't know. See ya. <laughs>